Good afternoon. How are you doing? Janine, sorry. It's okay. Um, good afternoon, Senators. I am in deep opposition to Senate Bill 637 because it strips away our rights to protect our health, our family's health, our property, our privacy. It also strips away local authority, giving rights to telecom companies that should be preserved as the rights of the people. The human body normally functions by using natural electromagnetic energy. And humans are electromagnetic beings. Thus, we are affected by electromagnetic fields in our environment. Originally called radio wave or microwave sickness, electrosensitivity is a medical condition brought on by microwave or wireless radiation. Electrosensitivity was recognized in radio, radar, and electricity workers in the 1930s through the 1950s when the military began using the symptoms of electrosensitivity as a basis for military electronic warfare. Currently, the U.S. Army uses microwave radiation, 95 gigahertz, that's just 5 gigahertz up from uh, the wireless spectrum that this technology, that this, these uh, small cell wireless facilities uh, will enable. Uh, the U.S. military is using 95 gigahertz as a biological weapon called the active denial system, and you can all Google that if you want to know what, more about that. In the 1960s and 70s, it was discovered that microwaves have an effect on hearing the blood-brain barrier, suicide, and cancer. And in the 1980s, electrosensitivity spread further into the general population alongside the rise in use of computers, cell phones, links with DNA breaks, melatonin, and Alzheimer's. In 2000, electrosensitivity was classified as a disorder and given an ICD code. The possibility of non-thermal harm, such as cancer, was accepted. It is also recognized in workers' compensation and diagnosis protocols. There have been over 8,000 8, peer-reviewed scientific studies done on health effects from wireless radiation. And there is a genetic component to it. Basically, one lacks the full spectrum of the full genetic complement to detoxify adequately. Experts are currently determining if radio frequency and extremely low frequency should be elevated to a class one human carcinogen. So what's going on here is totally backwards. The safety of this technology has not been demonstrated. In fact, quite the opposite. And the burden of proof is yours. our legislators and telecoms, not the publics, not the public whom you are charged to protect. Where is the proof that long-term exposure to small wireless communication facilities will have absolutely no effect on babies, children, and our delicate ecosystem. Do you know? Because I certainly haven't seen it. What I have seen is thousands of people worldwide suddenly and unexpectedly becoming sick after levels of radiation in their environment increased, often without their knowledge or consent. So these are people who are getting sick and not knowing why and then discovering something has changed in their environment. I have seen hundreds of scientific peer-reviewed studies done on health effects from microwave radiation that mirror my experience and the experience of thousands of others. I don't use wireless technology. I discovered in 2013 I could no longer hold a cell phone to my head because of constant pain and burning it caused. We are the evidence that wireless radiation causes harm. 
Are you going to continue to ignore us and cater to the wireless industry? Or will you please table Senate Bill 637 and declare a moratorium on this rollout of 5G technology until human safety testing is done and is conclusive, independent from industry? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. What we're trying to do today, just so everybody knows, you know, we've had several committee hearings, so we're trying to hold everybody to three minutes. I've got a nice long stack here, so I want to get, uh, try to get through these and uh, try to get our business done today. So um, we will be uh, hoping and uh, trying to keep you to the three-minute limit that you've asked on these cards. So next we have Bell Jackson of Michigan Safe uh, Technology out of uh, Holly, Michigan. Poses a bill and wishes to speak. Good afternoon. On February 27th, I mailed a letter via the Postal Service to every single Michigan legislator. I know you all got it because I already got a reply from one of you. That letter was an appeal to all of you to do your due diligence and educate yourselves on the vast amount of published independent scientific research on the issue of wireless radiation and its horrifying effects on biological life. The science is coming in now. Independent studies not corporate-funded studies, independent studies that you owe not only your constituents, but yourselves, your families, to become familiar with and take into consideration before any bills are passed that allow for the rollout of 5G. This bill does not need to be passed now. <laughs> this bill should not be passed in its current form because it does not address the issue of public safety nor does it make any accommodations for those who are sensitive to and suffer from wireless radiation fields. If you read the article 5G from blankets to bullets that I attached to my letter, you will see that 5G is going to exponentially increase the radio frequency fields and none of this technology, including what we are currently living in, was ever properly independently tested for its health impacts on biological life. Tom Wheeler, the head of the FCC in 2016, announced the rollout of 5G at a press conference on June 20th of that year to quote him, quote, stay out of the way of technological development. Unlike some countries, we do not believe that we should spend the next couple of years studying what 5G should be or how it should operate. Turning innovators loose is far preferable to expecting committees and regulators to define the future. We won't wait for the standards. It will generate tens of billions of dollars in economic activity, and that's damn important. Important to whom? The people sitting in the boardrooms of the telecom industry? If you pass this bill in its current form, you will be subjecting yourselves and your families to be test subjects for a technology that has never been tested. Why is the federal government and big telecom in such a big hurry to roll this out? Is it for the money? Do the federal government and multinational corporations have the right to put pressure on you to represent their interests over the interests of your state and your people? They do not have the right to coerce the states into accepting this untested technology, and the states need to stand up to them. Those of us opposed to this bill are not your adversaries. We are just people who have been interested enough in this issue to study it, to come to the understanding that this technology in its current form is a potential disaster for life as we now know it. Please, please table this bill and just take the time to educate yourselves on the potential health, safety, and privacy impacts of this untested technology. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have uh, Karen, is it Strode, uh, from Ypsilanti, poses a bill and wishes to speak. I think what I'll do, too, when we're getting close to three minutes, I'll let you know you have about 30 seconds to wrap it up, if you would, so we can get through to everybody, okay? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a registered pharmacist. I work for a university. Um, I coordinate financing uh, clinical cancer trials. Um, I'm here today representing a group of citizens who will not benefit from wireless 5G networks and will instead experience severe and debilitating health effects from this technology. I was diagnosed with electrical hypersensitivity in 2012, and I've included a letter from my doctor documenting my diagnosis. Uh, I experience head, neck, and chest pain from Wi-Fi, smart meters, cell phones, and cordless phones. My doctor recommended that I transform my home into a safe haven, and it is for this reason that I'm able to heal and to be here today. We removed all wireless technology and have a hardwired internet connection for computer and TV. Our smart meter has the radio function turned off. Uh, the nearest cell tower is a mile away. This bill will bring powerful and untested infrastructure to every residential street, including mine. My physician mandates that my residents be free from this ra radiation. However, the 5G installation at the street light in our front yard will make it impossible for me to live there. Are you willing to amend SB 637 to include provisions for medical accommodation for people like me with electric electrical hypersensitivity? This is crucial. On another point, the bill says that uh, the goal is to provide better access to emergency services. We can learn from what California residents are saying about 5G after the wildfires last October. After 77 cell towers were destroyed, city residents demanded not more cellular options, but landlines as a reliable option in a power outage. Wireless Nixie alerts and all other wireless means of communication instantly went down after this disaster. Uh, the equipment cabinets found next to every 5G utility pole contain lithium ion batteries stored as backup power, and these may explode in any fire. The California residents wanted infrastructure underground, fiber optic internet to every home. And in this case, the 5G equipment proved useless and possibly even hazardous in the, in the disaster. How is 5G going to help us in the event of a power outage? Respectfully submitted. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Mike Wadza from uh, Bloomfield Township in is it Gross Point City, Detroit, uh, poses a bill and wishes to speak. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Senator. How are you? Members of the committee. Make sure uh, you punch, push the uh, button and, and you're thank over. You. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I represent uh, ProTech, which is a consortium of 60 or so cities around the state, as well as some townships, uh, and then Gross Point City and Bloomfield Township. Senator, Mr. Chairman, you've, you've received some of our written materials, and uh, I gather that you've paid attention to, to those uh, because I know that there have been some changes, and I'd like to thank the committee and MML and MTA for working so hard on those things. But I guess the reason I'm here is that there's still some things that we really need to do to try and improve this bill if it's going to go forward and actually become law. I'm going to be very quick. Um, first, there are still some 40 states, I might be off by one or two, that have not passed this sort of legislation. And of the approximate 20 that have had this kind of legislation proposed, only about 10 have passed it. Now, again, I might be off one or two. Nice thing about telecommunications is that it changes daily. <clears throat> but that's important to bear in mind. We don't have to do this. Uh, I would suggest also that local communities and uh, the industry have been negotiating for several years over a very complex set of issues. One of the things we've succeeded in doing, I think, is mobility. You may have heard it had a plan at one time to build 120-foot towers right now, right away. And uh, that was a danger. And we convinced them of that, and they have backed off. They are not doing that anymore. 
And that's not because of any legislation. It's simply because of the give and take between the parties who are involved, the engineers who build the highways and the police officers who respond to accidents and so on. So that's been a good thing. And I would suggest and submit that we can continue to do that and, and that probably will re result in the best uh, for everyone. Um, so we don't have to do it. We would be only the 11th or 12th, I think, state in the, in the union to pass this kind of legislation, which clearly is very industry uh, motivated. Um, the bill takes the principal property interest of every community in this state and, <clears throat> and takes it in return for, unfortunately, <clears throat> in the bill, there's only a discussion of some platitudes and I, I don't, I don't mean to be derogatory, but, but there's no commitment in the bill to what it is exactly that the wireless industry is going to provide in exchange for this very generous giving of public and taxpayer supported property. We talk about what rates local government can charge wireless, but we don't talk about what rates wireless can charge the customers, the taxpayers who are going to pay for this uh, by not being adequately compensated. Uh, we don't talk about the service. What are they going to provide? How many mega megabits per second? Where are they going to hit these uh, unserved and underserved areas, the poor areas? None of that is in this bill. I remember when we did the Video Service Act, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you were involved, we had a provision in there, which AT&T in particular agreed to, about not allowing unserved or poor areas to be disadvantaged as a result of some of the concessions that local government and the state gave. None of that is in here. Um, and then rate. You know, well, I think I already touched on that. We talk about the rate that cities can charge for use of the right-of-way, but we don't charge, talk about uh, the rate that they're going to charge their customers, our taxpayers. And, you know, rate is important. It's, it, it doesn't do any good if the service is available, but you can't afford it. Um, size. I was privileged to be here at the first hearing, and um, Senator Joe Hewn, who we worked together on some good community issues a few years ago, and I appreciated that. But Senator Hewn held up a what I assume was a microcell, probably related to the cable industry. And it is about maybe one cubic foot, size of a small pizza box. And my understanding was that he was suggesting, as someone must have suggested to him, that that's what we're talking about here in terms of equipment and what's going to go on that phone pole out in front of your home. But that's not what the bill says. The bill says six feet and I think plus 25 cubic feet coming to like 31 cubic feet. That's, a, that's an industrial refrigerator on that phone pole out in front of your house. And the FCC has already told us that if one is on a pole and it's been approved, then others can come and there's three others. There's four wireless providers nationally. So we can look forward to potentially under this bill, the way it's written, four industrial refrigerators sitting on that phone pole out in front of your house. That is not a good thing, and we outlined that. We've, we're seeing uh, uh, equipment applications that are down the three, four, five cubic foot range, and we think that the bill should make that change so that what Mr. Hume, what Senator Hume uh, showed us is much more in line with what actually the bill allows. And then um, I was admonished not to talk about money. But the fact is this bill is about money. AT&T, Verizon, they want access to the right of way for essentially free. Uh, this bill represents fees that are about 10% of what we're seeing in other states that have not passed this kind of legislation. So it, it's a pretty significant give, and it's about the money. So if it's about the money for them, it needs to be, we need to have the conversation about the money, at least on behalf of the taxpayer, who otherwise is stuck holding the bag for maintaining those rights away on their own dime, as opposed to, if AT&T wants to be in the right away, that's fine. I don't oppose the technology, none of my clients do. But we want to be paid a fair market rate so that we can tell our residents, your constituents, that AT&T is sharing a reasonable fair market value cost of that right-of-way. And the numbers in the bill, although they've improved, thank you, they are still at about 10% of where we're, what we're seeing around the country. you got to wrap it up. got to wrap it up, please. I'm done. Oh, are you? Okay, I'm good. I'm done. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very, any questions? <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank Members. you. Thanks so thank much. You. Appreciate it. And, and you did have on your card, uh, you also oppose uh, 894 and 5097. I want to make put that on the record. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm sorry. Next we have um, Thomas Stroth. He's from uh, Ypsilanti also. I think you've asked for two to three minutes. What's that? You've asked for two to three minutes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, senators, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Thomas Strode. My wife, you've already heard from, uh, in her testimony regarding uh, the uh, electoral hypersensitivity that she has been diagnosed with, uh, she said, she indicated that uh, we had had to do several things to our home to make it a safe haven. And I want to inf uh, inform you of the steps we have taken more specifically to mitigate the effects of EMF fields from cell towers and smart meters. Uh, while smart meters are not the issue here, we are fearful that the steps we have taken will not be effective if a 5G antenna, antenna is placed on the pole in our front yard. Uh, aluminum is an excellent at attenuator of pulsed signals from smart meters and current cell phones. We have grounded the siding on our home and placed grounded aluminum screening on our windows. Um, there are a number of steps that we've taken. I, I can just shorten it up here. Uh, we replaced the electrical panel because we, it needed to be regrounded. We uh, added low-pass filters to significantly reduce the high-frequency transients or dirty electricity that was added to our power lines by the power supply of the smart meter. That continues to go on, even though it's an opt-out meter. We removed our wireless phone and replaced with corded phones with an, with a, um, an acoustic earpiece. We have all the cell phones, when they're in our house, are in airplane mode and the numbers are forwarded to our landline. We purchased three uh, registering meters to help with the mitigation we, uh, you know, in, or in order to know how much EMFs we, are, we have in our home. Uh, given these steps, has the committee found 5G technology to be safe? And if so, what data or studies have been reviewed to make that declaration? Uh, was it both industry and non-industry funded? Those are the questions that I have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next we have uh, Sheila, is it Pomeransky? Pomeransky. Pa Pomeransky, a concerned citizen out of Shelby Township, and also asked for three minutes. Okay. Welcome. Thank, th thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to take a few minutes to just speak a bit about um, the implementation of the 5G technology in Senate Bill 637. Um, just based on listening in the room, it's my understanding that the committee has done a very good job at addressing the business and industry issues associated with this uh, 5G technology. It's also my understanding that the committee has made some adjustments and accommodations for things like historical districts to, I think, preserve the aesthetics and things of that nature. Um, which is all great news for, for those individuals. However, I am here to discuss the, uh, the public health portion of the implementation of the 5G technology. I am not aware of any other committee discussions other than today where we're starting to bring some of this to light in front of the committee. Um, I personally am someone that is considered to be at risk to the effect of microwave radiation technology. Um, it is well documented. I don't know if my documents got distributed to, to the committee. Um, it's documented by my physician, Dr. Diane Kulik. Uh, she has been treating me ever since a significant cancer diagnosis back in 2008. She has provided uh, medical documentation, and I quote, it states that Sheila Pomeransky has had a diagnosis of cancer, and certainly with the research on EMF exposure and cancers, she should be able to legally have an option to refuse a smart meter on her home. Now this, of course, is speaking specifically to smart meters. However, um, as the document, documentation she's referring to refers to EMF radiation, EMF fields, exposures, this certainly applies to the technology that we're talking about with 5G as well. 
Um, Dr. Kulik also shared with me, and I have provided that to the committee as well, a summary of a couple of resources from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. This uh, American Academy of Environmental Medicine is a, has an executive committee made up of um, medical doctors and doctors of um, osteopathic physicians. The AAEM has made recommendations based on double-blinded, placebo-controlled uh, studies research in humans, um, and they state, in quotes, because smart meters produce radio frequency emissions, it is recommended that patients with the above conditions and disabilities be accommodated to protect their health. Now, again, this specifically spoke to smart meters, but I'm taking this a little bit larger to talk about radio frequency radiation and the emissions that are the 5G technology is going to be um, putting out, if you will. Um, and you will find all the conditions uh, referenced in the document that I have provided to you, including cancer. So, of course, this is something that is of great attention uh, to me personally, and my hope would be to anybody else you know that has experienced any kind of a cancer diagnosis. So I would like to just sort of reiterate that the 5G technology will also expose the public to these radio frequency emissions. And there's some documentation that my physician has provided me supporting some of her research as to why she's saying this is not healthy for me to have anything like this near or on my home. Now, I personally have gone to great lengths to eliminate or minimize my exposures to radio frequency emissions to protect my health. Like others that you have heard, um, I have made some investments. I have placed radio frequency guards over my smart meter. My smart meter is in a radio off uh, mode supposedly, um, but I've placed guards over my meter. I've also placed guards over my neighboring meters to uh, mitigate the effects of any of the radio frequency emissions coming to my home um, from my neighbors. We also do not use the Wi-Fi. Our computers are hardwired in our home as well. I have eliminated cordless phones. I use a cell phone only occasionally, and when I do, it is on speakerphone. And all of these actions, um, we have done so that I'm able to reduce my exposure to radio frequency emissions to protect my health coming from where I've come from, which was a very dark place. <sighs> Given this information, you can see why someone like me or anybody else that has dealt with a cancer diagnosis has a concern over the implementation of 5G technology. <clears throat> My questions to the committee are, has the committee determined that this technology is safe? And if you have, what safety determinations were done? What kind of scientific or medical background did these people do to make a determination that this technology is safe for me, for you, for your children, for your grandchildren? This technology is very controversial, and I believe we need to give serious consideration upfront to the review of the scientific and medical research studies and documentation. Many experts have determined that this technology is unsafe for human health, and I think the committee needs to take this into consideration. So I have a request. It's twofold. I request that this Energy and Technology Committee please take some time, take a pause, review the testimony of and, and, and the documents that are available to people and the hope is that we will be able to bring some more documentation to you to show you the medical and scientific inf impacts of this technology. I'm not sure I understand what the rush is to push this through before people have had an opportunity to provide you some information to show you that there is danger to you and your families. And I also request that consistent with the American Academy of Environmental Mes Medicine to provide medical accommodations to protect people at risk based on their studies. I believe that if we take the time up front to discuss this, it will be most efficient in the most efficient in the planning of the 5G infrastructure and the safety of the public. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Lori M. Uh, M. Ball, uh, from uh, Milford opposes the bill and wishes to speak. Good afternoon. You got pushed a little red button towards the bottom of the mic. Right, there you go. Uh -huh. All right, yep. very good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, much of what I wanted to say has already been said. I just want to uh, reemphasize what many people have come here to say. I too am electromagnetically sensitive. I've taken extreme measures to make my house livable. 
I too have a, a smart meter that's been turned off, the radio's off, and I have to sleep every night in basically a Faraday cage. If you ignore the request here of the citizens who, by the way, you've got a, a provision right here on page three of the bill, uh, section number four, that this bill is supposed to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Well, we're challenging you on that. There are many states who've taken a pause and said, wait, let's find out what real research says, non-industry funded research. If you choose to go ahead with this, you must make provisions for people who are medically intolerant of these radio waves. I've spent $1,000 on a, a, a cage that I can sleep under, made of fabric that doesn't allow these kind of radio waves. Shouldn't people who have medical needs and documentation for being sensitive to this have some sort of an accommodation? Shouldn't I be able to get a grant for the $1,000? What about people who've spent thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars, making their homes safe? Let's think about our needs and not just the financial needs of this industry. We're not opposed to technology. We want to see Michigan to be a technology leader, but not at the expense of your citizens' health and privacy and the other um, uh, aspects that this will damage us as well. Please take a pause, consider the evidence, really look at the medical evidence and the scientists that have said this could be dangerous, and think of ways, let the industry think of ways that we can still be a leader in industry and maintain our health. After all, as they say, your health is your wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Dina Hilbert, um, is opposed to all three bills and wishes to speak, and she's from Rochester Hills, Michigan. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you um, for allowing me to speak. I'm not the best public speaker, but I'm trying to make this short. As you said, I've been posing the three bills. I have a lot of concerns that um, this, this, these bills would impair the municipalities and citizens of Michigan to have a say in the rollout of the 5G infrastructure, especially related to health issues. Um, I'm concerned that there's a lack of consideration regarding to those who suffer from these type of illnesses and a disregard for an increasing um, body of science that's being brought forward regarding this technology. I've been a nurse for almost 40 years, and one thing I can tell you is people are sensitive to all kinds of things. Apples, hair dye, um, uh, I don't know, there's just, there's just all kinds of things. And you probably know, many of you may have a sensitivity to different things. If we look historically, look back at smoking and asbestos, if we had known before we went forward with that, just think of all the lives and the, the money we would have saved as a country, you know, regarding the illnesses that these things have caused. Um, so myself, I just was recently tested for 388 food sensitivities, and I found out I'm allergic to cashews, vanilla. Um, I've got suffer from eczema this last year, but I'm able to accommodate my diet, so this is getting better. I'm starting to sleep better. I don't scratch in the middle of the night. For these people with these illnesses, um, if we have this constant radiation on their homes, you know, they're going to suffer from this greatly. Um, I know people and witness people that suffer from um, EMS sensitivity, rashes, um, rosacea, uh, can't sleep at night. I've known several people and I just, I really think that we need to consider this in this bill. Recently, a Dr. Ronald Kostoff, who submitted testimony to the state of Maryland regarding a simple, similar 5G rollout bill, he provided many studies, which I've provided to the clerk, some of his information for the record, that he's concerned about the health problems that we will all be um, dealing with in the future regarding the packets of non-iodine non radio frequency that will be constantly bathing our homes 24-7. He was adamant that this 5G technology would be a major contributing factor to the onset of a myriad of serious diseases in the future. Are you ready to be responsible for that? So please don't rush this bill. Um, also, I just want to put a caveat in here. I'm really concerned about schools and school children. I mean, would you want your children bathed in this 24-7? I, I don't. I, I don't. My children are grown. I don't want my cran grandchildren to have to be, have this, you know, on school. So I don't know if that's been considered. Um, in closing, I have a question for this bill. 
Has any, uh, anybody on this committee that has reviewed this 5G data have a medical license in the state of Michigan or a scientific background? I look forward to your response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have, is it uh, Ton Belliger from uh, South Lyon, Michigan? Uh, poses a bill and wishes to speak and actually poses all three bills that we're looking at today. Yeah, it's already turned on. Oh, yep, you're all set. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As an elected representative of Northfield Township, I'm concerned with the, the direction that this series of small cell infrastructure bills is taking. Now, I know there have been some adjustments and uh, trying to uh, accommodate some concerns of local units of government, but this, these bills still appear to be taking a uh, direction of trampling local authority. Now, in order to protect and ensure the best interest of constituents, non-essential infrastructure such as this needs to be controlled and authorized by the local governing units. The people need to have a voice, and the local municipalities answer what is best for the people in the, with their neighborhoods and communities. That's where the people are best represented. Why is this a statewide bill driven by industry? Why is the state involved at all? It, it, it hints of cronyism. Naturally, this technology ought to be driven by demand, by the free market, by the local consumer. The people are seeing that the further away from their home that these policies are made, the more these policies become tainted with lobbyist influence. It requires exceptional character and selfless, to selflessly stand firm for the preservation of liberty and do the right thing. Let there be respect, respect for the local governing units. Protect the rights of local jurisdictions to authorize or deny the small cell infrastructure and other non-essential technologies in their communities. And uh, you're welcome for the privilege to serve the constituents of Michigan. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next we have Pamela Wallace, a resident of Rochester, Michigan, opposes all three bills and wishes to speak. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm here also in opposition of the three bills um, because as they've been written, I don't see a commitment to the public health on the level that is warranted by the current research. I too am somebody who suffers from electrohypersensitivity. A lot of what has been said today, I'll echo, I've had to make great modifications in my life, but I also wanna show you a little bit about what that looks like. So I'm gonna do something a little unconventional. <laughs> might notice that I've got little spots on my face, right here, right here. I'm going to show you a little leg, gentlemen. This is a rash that from being exposed as a direct result of my being exposed to microwave radiation. And it itches. If you've ever had poison ivy, it itches probably about 100 times more than poison ivy. It wakes you up at night. I've had it covering my whole entire body. Okay, I go through times of remission, but it has covered my whole entire body. I know Senator Knopf, she had knee surgery. Thankfully, you were able to get some relief from a, dis a very difficult condition. Imagine not being able to. Imagine living in a world that has things in it, an environmental thing that's going to cause you to be sick and stay sick. And it goes a lot farther than a rash for many of us. It aggravates cancer like we've heard, there are so many things that this brings to the table that have not been considered in this bill and have probably not been considered in this overall conversation to the level that is absolutely necessary. Um, there's a couple of studies, the uh, 
NTP study and the Ramazzini study that's coming out on March 22nd that is they're the largest study of its kind on this type of technology. Both of these studies point securely to this being a cancer-causing technology. You guys have to understand this is a higher frequency technology. It is actually more resembling x-ray technology and atomic technology. This is taking us in a direction that we've never been before. And there's really no going back on this. So there are some things that people brought up today that we can learn from other communities that have already implemented. There are lessons to be learned that we should be taking into very strong consideration. We should be building in best practice in the foundational pieces of this bill. So with this, I'm making a request that you allow the public to come forth prior to voting on any of these bills and provide you the necessary medical and scientific resources via a PowerPoint. Allow us to make a presentation before you vote on any of these bills. We have scientists and medical professionals who are willing to bring all of the information you need for the public health portion to you, available to you. They're willing to do this via Skype. They're willing to come and testify. So my request is that you allow the public portion. I've seen that you've worked with other stakeholders. You've worked with municipalities. You've worked with the telecom communication. You've brought them all to the table. To my knowledge, the public has not been brought to the table at that level. And the public needs to be brought to that table at that level. Because we're the ones, all of us, you guys too, that are going to be affected. And I'm going to close with saying that this impacts lives considerably. My dinner table conversation is, what other countries don't have this technology? Are we going to be leaving our families to just be safe, just be able to live? When I go out of town to stay in a hotel, I have to see how close it is to a cell phone tower, if it has a cell phone tower. The reality of this is, is that it's nice to have internet that goes five to 10 times faster, but I don't need internet that goes five to 10 times faster at this cost. But what I need and we all need is our health. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Our last uh, speaker uh, on all three bills opposes all three uh, and wishes to speak is David, is it Lanier, Lanier? Uh, utility meter choice for Michigan, Auburn Hills, Michigan. Uh, three to five or three minutes. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, a bill very similar to this was uh, introduced uh, in California, and uh, the uh, governor of uh, California vetoed that bill. And this issue has been addressed by a couple of the speakers before me, but it is control, local control over the uh, rollout of uh, this uh, technology. And the reason Jerry Brown uh, vetoed that bill is because of this, because in the bill, which is very similar to your bill, uh, the uh, local communities, the counties, the cities, townships, as the gentleman spoke earlier before, do not actually have enough uh, control over the, uh, the deployment of it. There's no telling what's gonna happen at the local level. And it's very important particularly in our structure of government, where we have a self-governing society where people make the decisions as to, what to what's gonna happen and they, have, and they have a voice. This bill basically takes the voice away from the local governments and it would be very useful to take that out of the bill, particularly, and another issue is uh, the amount of money it's gonna cost, what it's gonna to cost to the local governments and to the taxpayers. This seems to be in the bill that there's a cap placed on the money that's going to be, uh, that the I may be wrong on this, that the uh, uh, telecom companies are going to reimburse the cities for their, for whatever costs they're gonna have. I believe there is a cap on it, I'm not sure, but there was, I believe, in the California bill. But at any rate, reconsider it, take that out of the bill, and also consider the health issues. That's very important to us, too. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Seeing no other cards on uh, Senate Bill 637, I need a motion to adopt the S2 subversion of Senate Bill 637. So moved by uh, Senator Hewn. Are there any questions or discussions? Senator Shootmaker? Can I ask what the interplay is with regards to 1597 with the other two bills? 1597 is the uh, uh, right of way reform for right. broadband expansion. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. And what's what's the so, question? E, e, that's a separate bill from the other package. It is. Okay. That's correct. Yep. Thank you. It just happens to deal with a sort of related issue, and so that's why we're taking it up today. 
uh, it passed the House and it came over, and so we put it on the agenda. Um, any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Knopfs. Yes. Senator Pros. Yes. Senator Horn. Yes. Senator Shoemaker. Yes. Senator Hewn. Yes. Senator Shirky. Yes. Senator Zorn. Yes. Senator Hopgood. Yes. Senator Knizek. Yes. Senator Conyers. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have 10 yeas, 0 nays. The substitute is adopted. Okay, thank you.